All right, welcome back to Problem Solver Politics. I am your host, Carton Ellis, with Cody the Oracle. Hey, everyone. How are you doing? And we're going to talk about two things today. First, we're going to talk about a really interesting policy proposal of Andrew Yang about uh, an internal American exchange student program, which is pretty cool. Uh, but before we get to that, we're actually going to respond to uh, one of the comments, do a little comment video within the video here, from Samson Sue. Uh, one of our subscribers here made a really uh, interesting question. He said, Cardin, double exclamation mark. Two exclamation marks are better than one. I'm surprised you hardly ever vote for Democrats because you don't sound like one of those wacky, crazy conspiracy conservatives who would do upper caps everything, anything to back Trump no matter what he does. Then he says a bunch of explicatives that we'll just uh, go over. On the contrary, I really like what you are saying. I've only watched two episodes about Yang on your channel so far, and I really like you guys. Thank you, Samson. Screw corporate media. I'm for every single fair-minded independent media that gives people a voice, and I love what you're doing. And then he asked a question. What are, your pol what are you political-wise, if you don't mind asking? Are you for Yang or just being fair to him because you don't like the way he was treated? Either way is fine. Just wondering. So um, what am I political-wise, if you don't mind asking? I don't mind you asking. I think that's great. And are you for Yang or just being fair to him? I, I actually really appreciate that somebody recognizes that you complain will just be fair to somebody. I, I really feel like I'm trying to be fair to Yang as I would try to be fair to anybody. Um, but this question really does illustrate, Cody, the birth of this channel. Uh, me and Cody are both uh, miniature political philosophers that had an opinion that we wanted to express. But what are we going to express opinions about? Trump? Uh, the media does that all day long. Who are we going to express opinions about? Beto O'Rourke, who has nothing substantial or substantive on his website to talk about. We generally gravitated towards Andrew Yang because he was the only per person putting actual specific policy proposals out that could be analyzed. He's the only person that put chips on the table that could be scrutinized. And so we dove right in because we're kind of policy wonks like that and we love the numbers. So um, are you for Yang? There's lots of things I am for Yang on. Um, I love that he's pushing forward the conversation on the UBI. What's interesting is I'm surprised Republicans didn't get there first because Republicans are so, so supposedly the parties of economics. There's other things that he has not sold me on. Uh, some conversations he's had about Second Amendment gun protections and so on and so forth well, yeah, the, 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 have I, lost me. <laughs> one funny, not funny, but I, I don't want to get back and relitigating this. But yeah. I, I just saw a tweet come up and I kind of... Part of his proposal is he's going to fine gun companies a million dollars per death in a mass shooting, which is like, okay, sounds good in the surface level, but then when you have to actually ask, like, who manufactures firearms? There's surplus, <laughs> there are surplus weapons in the United States, I believe, that were manufactured by the Soviet Union's government. Yeah. So, <laughs> again, like I said, I love Andrew Yang. The Mauser. I, I love the stuff he's talking about. We're going um, after English allies. Yeah, I can't say I'm a thousand percent for the guy. I read stuff like that and I'm like, dude, we're going to go to war with China because the Chinese manufactured guns using a mass shooting. Like, sorry, China, your Chinese company's got to pay us $15 million because of a shooting that happened in our country with one of our citizens. I guess our citizens. They'd be like, get yeah. out of here. So, like I said, there is things that we do think that maybe, or I can't speak for yourself. Personally, yes. Don't let everything he says. However, the stuff that I think really, truly does matter is important because say what you want about Second Amendment. That's a Supreme Court issue because it's, you know, in the Constitution. But one thing that isn't quite a Supreme Court issue, which talks about a lot, which is automation, the fact that people are losing jobs, the fact that people are losing purpose in this country. And he's actually he's one of the few people I've actually seen say, I think people in this country are losing their purpose. I think it's draining the soul of this nation. We have to do something. And I yeah. think the UBI is a step in the right direction. I think not heard anyone else even dance on that everyone else is and, and even the ubi we've analyzed and have a lot of questions about uh especially in terms of how it could actually effectively be paid for so anyway we're just going to go back to answering samson sue's question um, when he says what are you political wise uh, i can't speak for cody but i believe he's kind of in the same boat to be honest with you i very much struggle answering that question not out of fear but i don't know what to say i i very much I very much am think I feel like I'm adrift, to be honest with you. I feel a little bit politically homeless nowadays. I'm definitely not voting for the Democratic Socialists. My grandfather escaped the National Socialist Party in Germany uh, because they were marching through Poland, killing all of his family members. And oh, yeah, my other grandfather 
escaped the socialists, uh, Fidel Castro and his brother, who had a death sentence on him for being a journalist in Cuba. So don't expect me to be voting for the Democratic Socialists anytime or anything associated with them, which pretty much takes most Democrats off the table, okay? However, when I turn around and I look at the Republicans, I, I was a, a assisting the local Republican Party in my city and, and, and had my own spat with them where, where we got into, they actually voted me off their committee in a five to two vote because we were arguing about the importance of social media and modernizing and ad adjusting the conservative message, which, which California and America needs right now to a more modern era. And they just, they just refuse to modernize. And I'm not a person that refuses to modernize and you lose me when you refuse to modernize. So to a certain extent, I feel like both of us felt a little politically homeless. And that's why we ended up just going with the problem solving route. I mean, you look at the logo that's sitting behind Cody right here and it's problem solver politics, not Republican, Democrat, progressive, liberal, or right wing politics but pragmatic solution-based problem-solving politics. And since Andrew Yang was talking about solving problems, we naturally gravitated towards him. Would you say that's a fair assumption, Cody? Yeah, and I would say just personally for me, the biggest thing with Andrew Yang that time and time again, because again, there's times where I read something he proposes and I'm like, oh, wow, is that really going to work? Um, sometimes I, I read stuff and go, wow, oh my God, I can't believe someone finally said that. However, I would say the biggest thing Andrew Yang has brought to the kind of modern political sphere that I, I don't want to see leave more than anything is he has been on record that I'm not going to get involved in divisive name calling rude politics. I'm not going to do that because ultimately, man, like everyone, you can ask anyone. People will say, "Oh yeah, people are politicizing too much, and it's probably going to become an issue." One day, it's not probably going to be. It's going to be an issue we're facing, and I think we're getting there sooner than later. So having someone running for president who's like, you know what, he's very clearly anti-Trump. He said multiple times, "I'm most I'm running in part to get him out of office," but I don't get this just endless shrieking anger from him and it's not unique to the left from the right you'll see it as well where it's like people just can't even be happy anymore because someone else is a different opinion than them i think the best thing about politics is we get to both bring our best argument to the table and then suss it out together that's kind of the point of doing this stuff but we've gotten so far away from that andrew yang seeming to making a, a concerted effort to coming back to that coming back to saying look i'm going to put a policy out there and if people prove me wrong or change my mind so be it let's make it work for the people I get it's a bit naive and pie in the sky, but I yeah. do like seeing it. It's nice to see. Yeah. I don't know if it'll be here forever. I don't know if things are going to get worse. I don't know if, you know, maybe we are kind of hyper-politicized now, but five years down the line, it's just going to be an afterthought. Hey, remember how crazy things were? So that is with me the biggest thing I see with Andrew Yang, though, is a sense of I noticed he embraced former Trump voters immediately, which told me he actually cares about the American people living in this country and not just his base, which was really big to me. Yeah, and there's there's a word for people like you and me. And and I love a, a recent press release put out by Andrew Yang about the exhausted majority. He literally references in one of his more recent press release where he talks about how February is the best month of our campaign. We received donations from 34,000 people, you know, in excess of half a million dollars, so on and so forth. But then he puts out this graph that's really interesting. I don't know if you can pull it up, Cody. But up? he basically puts people, um, according to a lot of research done by Jonathan Haidt, which we love. All right. He is the guy that did the TED talk on the moral roots of liberals and conservatives. And he was actually able to develop men um, measurable quantifiers that show liberals think in two pathways. Uh, conservatives generally think in five pathways. And these are their moral roots and their behaviors. And he basically divided up the American populace into progressive activists, traditional liberals, passive liberals, politically disengaged, moderates, traditional conservatives, and devoted conservatives. And he showed how basically the wings are doing just fine in their activism, but there's this exhausted majority. And this actually really hit home in my heart. When Richard Nixon in the 60s talked about the silent majority, that really made sense to me. Because in the 60s, you see all of the rabble rousing going on. How old were you then? Yeah, no, I'm just saying. And I'm when just you, kidding. I'm when, when I read like the journals and I talk to my grandparents who lived through that era, they definitely were silent majority members. And when I look at Andrew Yang talking about people in this bell curve as the exhausted majority I felt that, and it makes me think, you know, <laughs> this guy understands me a little bit better than well, others and, like, do. And, the heartbreaking thing about it is what is, by and large, towering over every other uh, group of people? It's the politically disengaged. And, dude, I, I, I've been reading our comments and going through after what happened in the debates the last two nights. I can't tell you how frequently I've seen the sentiment of, like, 
oh my god, like what's even going on with this political system anymore? Like I don't even know if I care anymore. Like, People let tune Trump out. win. Who cares? But what I'm saying is, and they become disengaged, which is worse. The opposite of hate is not love. The opposite of love is not hate. It is apathy, and disengagement is apathy. And the worst thing you can have in a political sphere is apathy, and that's what all of this hatred from each wing well, is causing. I would say apathy of the um, mainly rational consensus if the super crazy far right fringes were or far right and far left fringes were apathetic that'd be great man but what the problem is we're seeing the apathy again i think this is a pretty visual representation the apathy is coming from your average person who doesn't wake up every morning saying how can i be a better democrat and they don't go to bed every night saying was i a good enough republican today but people who basically just wake up and go about their lives those are the people who they look to the right look to the left and go like oh my god i don't want to be with any of these people where do I belong? And the problem is when 26% of the population just says, I belong nowhere, I'm done. That is statistically extremely significant over a quarter, right? And then you look at people that are passive liberals and moderates. Again, people that aren't, they, they don't wake up every morning and put their red hat or the blue tie on and they just go about life. They're also in that group of people that are like, who do I even vote for? I mean, I think there was a quote that, that came out during the debates, a reporter tweeted out during the Democratic debates where someone turned to his friend and said, I don't even know if I'm a Democrat anymore. Like I don't even re recognize. Tim Pool was talking about well, the Washington video Post it. article. But yeah. yeah but, well, but the, the larger point to that that I want to speak on is the fact that one that was not a cheap seat. So that wasn't you know Mister um, you know Mister Grassroots Bernie supporters like yeah oh, I don't think they're treating people. I mean those are expensive seats. Those are the kind of mainstream corporate Democrats who's going to be there. And yeah, I mean, both parties have said and done things that have alienated their bases in recent years where we are where we are today, where you look and, you know, I don't want to say Jonathan hates never wrong about anything, but I would say roughly one in four people saying, you know what the hell with it? I can't deal with this political nonsense anymore. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. Maybe even higher, you know, and that's, but the thing that stands out about Andrew Yang speaking about this is because what this tells me and you can see it. I, I see it interacting with you guys in the comments all the time. Andrew Yang knows this. And he knows, you know what? Just because these people are politically disengaged doesn't mean they don't count as voters. Yeah. And he's circled, in my opinion, he's circled this exhausted majority. And he said, you know what? I'm not going to get the progressive activists. I'm not going to get the devoted conservatives. Probably not going to get traditional conservatives. But I can get moderates, passive liberals, Well, he's getting liberals. Tucker Carlson. And the reason why he's getting Tucker Carlson is because the first word that comes to my mind is welcoming. Generally, I find the Yang gang and the Yang community and Andrew Yang's policies to be much more welcome to open debate. And the only way you're ever going to change the few people's minds who you can change is through that open debate. And if you don't welcome the person into the conversation and then also follow that up with another welcome of the debate, you're never going to get there. And I don't see another person's campaign that's welcoming Anybody else in a coalition that's not further to the left than them. I don't see Kirsten Gillibrand. I don't see Kamala Harris. I don't see Joe Biden. I don't see any of those leftists on stage. I don't see Elizabeth Warren, none of them, saying, hey, Trump people, we welcome you. Hey, moderate liberals, we welcome you. Hey, you know, anti-war activists on the fringe that have something decent to say, we welcome you. I, I see a whole lot of hatred throwing shade everywhere else. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, uh, this went far much longer. <laughs> Yeah, so then so, the original so, so, two minutes so, that we planned to to for it, it though, but, but, <laughs> but sorry, but I, I do think this was a good setup because this is true. Andrew Yang, I believe just today, I saw it just today, uh, added the new thing to new to one of his hundred plus policies, an American exchange program. And I'm not going to read all of it, but he says Americans are becoming more and more socially isolated, which unfortunately is true. Um, the divide between urban and rural America is much wider than it used to be. And it's a larger detriment of one's partisan leanings than almost any other metric. America is sorting itself into distinct groups and losing empathy for fellow Americans. He goes on to outline, he says, As president, I will initiate the American Exchange Program as part of our public education system to foster civic engagement while introducing young Americans to fellow citizens they would otherwise not have an opportunity to meet. That's awesome. Yeah. Prior to receiving their UBI, high school graduates would embark on a multi-regional exchange program to different regions and communities. That's actually a really cool idea. And civic education would be included in the programming so that each person has a higher sense of citizenship the program would last for at least, at least six weeks to allow for students to become sufficiently immersed in the new location. This is one thing really quickly, and then I'll, I'll get your opinion on it. I want to know, but when we were talking about Second Amendment earlier, this is one thing where I do think it's visible in Andrew Yang's own. If you, if you grew up in suburban or suburban New York and then moved to Silicon Valley, 
you're not going to have the same perspective on firearms as someone who grew up in a rural part of the country. Yeah, of their just, necessity and of 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 the essence that it is to your soul and your community. Well, just, yeah, it just and it legitimately there is a different culture. Like you can look at the United States of America and say it's one country, but it, I mean, if to put it in perspective. Japan is roughly the size of California. Like the notion yeah. that because we are the United States that like everyone lives the same life is wrong. The cool thing is we're a big country that has a similar language. For the most part, a similar culture we all engage in. Yeah. But the lifestyles are so radically different. Like if you get in your car and drive from Los Angeles to Houston, you cross like basically all of Europe. I mean, like yeah. <laughs> that's it, true. It, it is really important to keep in mind that someone who lives in rural Nebraska and someone who lives in New York City fundamentally do not experience the American life the same way. They just live in really almost different countries. We yeah. share a lot, but what's and, your day-to-day life is very different. And you can't look at the map of all the counties that generally vote Republican or voted for Trump and the counties and the precincts that generally voted for Obama or voted for Hillary Clinton and not really realize very quickly that you're looking at the classic urban versus rural argument it's very easy for somebody like me that went down to argentina and lived there for two years when you see the bickering between the political factions there as realizing oh yeah well these are the urban idiots that don't think anybody's smart outside of city limits and then these are the rural people that think all of the people inside of the city aren't tough and are a bunch of weak little you know pansies and city slickers so sometimes we have to step back from our own psyche and remember that 70% of political association and affiliation is simply social affiliation, meaning the people you hang around and the family you grew up in. All right. And one of the best radio hosts I ever heard said, you know, if we really wanted to, we could just call the Democrat Party the urban party and the Republican Party the rural party and just call it a day. But we don't do that because we believe in civil engagement and we believe in cooperation. And so um, I'm actually a huge fan of this idea. I don't get where funding for this would be. I don't get what the enforcement arm would be. Um, But I can say that I was in Babelsberg Studios in Germany. And all the time you meet people from the Directors Guild or these other guilds and the unions we have here in Hollywood. And as part of getting into uh, a lot of these guilds and these organizations and these unions is you go, you have to go work as a PA or you have to go work as an assistant director. You have to go work somewhere overseas or in another production far away, almost like an internship. So all these people that actually do make it into uh, their guild or into um, their trade organization have these really cool stories of, oh, yeah, dude, I was in Japan for six weeks filming this, you know, crazy you know, Kawasaki uh, commercial with a bunch of, you know, Kung Fu and Cirque du Soleil artists. And, you know, they all have had this wildly enriching cultural experience that kind of takes off the rough edges of your biases as a human being. And I'm all for it. Also, when you look internationally, it's like 60 percent. By the way, this is this is a quote that I'm not quoting exactly, but I, I know the generalities of it. You look at Canada, you look at Australia, you look at Britain. And the vast majority of these citizens have passports and travel outside of their country, whereas the vast minority of U.S. citizens have passports and travel outside of their country. So oftentimes as Americans, sometimes we will lack that that experience. OK, well, one thing I think is just really quickly. I want to uh-huh. pick up that point. Uh, I know you can't see I'm throwing it on the screen right now. If you were to take a geographical map of Texas, overlay it over Europe, you could basically <laughs> drive from Zagreb, Croatia all the way through Austria, all the way through Germany, all the way to the northern tip of Netherlands and go a few miles off the coast of the Netherlands. <laughs> and that's going from one part of Texas to the other. So again, yeah, like the idea that we do live in this country, but we have to... So uh, Ted Cruz is the senator of Europe. Essentially senator of France, yeah. I mean, if you were to if you were to overlay the map differently, it's basically Texas inside of France. And also one thing to keep in mind, Texas is like one-fifth the size of Alaska, which is also a state in the United States, which is like miles away from Russia, basically borders Canada. <laughs> doesn't put, I mean, like, the notion that, like, I get that we're all in the United States of America, but it really is. One would just be such a cool experience With only 600,000 people. Well, dude, yeah. imagine, imagine going from Miami and when you're 18 or 17 years old, you spend a few weeks at Anchorage, Alaska. Like, dude, that's almost like two different worlds. I mean, you, it's once far, again, long, far away, you know? Once again, Andrew Yang proposes a proposal that I look as being very wholesome, very socially awesome. I question how on earth it would be implemented. But let me tell you, I feel much more comfortable talking about policy proposals like this than 
Medicare for all, including every illegal immigrant that comes here that will crash our economy. I feel much more comfortable talking about an American student exchange program than I do over fascism and or just pure Honestly, unadulterated communism. I, I'm more on board with getting Americans involved in not just their community, but the kind of the whole nation and everything we do. Yeah. I'm bigger in that than building a wall. You know what I mean? Like there's, True. there's other options for the southern True. border, but... Yeah, what are the other options for getting people in this country to just kind of come together and recognize, you know what, we do live in different places, we do have different lives, but we are still Americans, and that's the cool thing. Yeah, our show is Problem Solver Politics, and one of the biggest problems, and one of the reasons we started this show is because Americans are at their throats and they hate each other. And imagine how much we would not hate each other as a society if we all had to travel amongst each other and get to know each other before we started throwing shade. I mean, honestly, I can say, living in suburban Los Angeles my entire life, I legitimately could not imagine a week in rural Nebraska. Like, I don't like. what do they do? I'm serious. What do they do when they wake up? I get they don't live on Mars, but like, what? Like, do you like go like, like drive your truck around? Like, I, Andrew I, I'm just Yang? saying, like, it, it is legitimately a question. I, I would imagine the inverse. They'd say the same thing. What do city people do? You know, it's a real thing. Look, if you pay for our week in rural Nebraska, me and Cody will go. That's a promise, Andrew Yang. Anyway, um, we want to know you guys' opinions. Please comment on this video below. We'll uh, try and respond as often as we can, but we really value the participation, the sharing, the whole nine yards. This is Problem Solver Politics.